Today marks precisely 150 years since an explosion at the Oaks Colliery killed 383 Barnsley miners. A number of the victims were under 14 and the youngest were just 10 years old. Mr Speaker, can I therefore seek your guidance on how best to ensure that this House commemorates the service and sacrifice of all those who lost their lives at the Oaks Colliery disaster 150 years ago today? Well, my answer to the Honourable Gentleman is as follows. First of all, I think he's gone some distance. day that Wednesday, bitter cold, snow dusting ground. It had been bitter for days, and though we didn't want a hard winter, God knew. It meant plenty of work for men. Men who went down that cursed oil to keep country warm, and two weeks before Christmas, they all wanted all the work and money they could get, and they all went down for Bairns for Christmas. If you look at the history of the Oaks, 19 years before the 66 disaster, there was another large one that killed over 70. Um, and then right in, in those 20 years, there were reports again and again coming up of, of men refusing to work because it was too gassy, it was too dangerous. I wasn't really thinking about numbers, and it was something the volunteers always emphasised, that they weren't interested in what the final number was, really. Up to that point, these had just been names on a sheet. So we wanted to, to kind of bring those people um, really the dignity they deserve after all this time. It's a disaster that has been forgotten in time. The disaster that happened in 1866 at the Oats Colliery has never had a proper monument to it. It's almost sort of as if it wanted to be forgotten. It is the worst disaster and not a lot of people know about it. It sort of came from a conversation between me and Paul Ardman, uh, really how, how it started off. And just through talking, uh, between ourselves and then meeting people in a group called People of Mining. We're all ex-miners. So it was like a big family coming together and making some ideas about and then was asking Graham if he could, you know, come up with a design. So basically have the woman walking forward over a kind of uh, rural landscape with coal cascading down her back um, and obviously her husband digging his own grave underneath. We decided to ask the people in mining if they were interested in taking this, this project forward. We gave them ideas of what we wanted to do and they also gave us their ideas and this is how it's worked together, you know. People's ideas come together and if somebody's got a better idea, we're always willing to listen, you know. And this is the magic of people in mining. So I suggested an halo. Um, it's not really an halo, but I see it as an halo. But it also represents the pithead winding wheel as well as the circle of life. Because this community, she's, even though she's moving towards a colliery, she is moving forward into a, another life. The Oaks Colliery is England's worst mining disaster and there has never been a national memorial to that disaster. Wales, Scotland have their national memorials, so we hope that this will be a national memorial for England. There's been so many little accidents and disasters at pits where three or four men have been killed, and they don't get the recognition, so we want it to be national. We want this for everybody. People say these people have been nearly forgotten about, just something about it, and that's why we get our confidence and strength from people saying, do it, do it while you've got chance. Owners were never forward about safety. Coal were good, demand were great, people were sacrificed. 73 souls at Oaks in 1847, Darley Main 75 in 1849, 52 at Warren Vale in 1851, 
six at Lund Hill in 1854, followed by a further 189 in 1857, 59 at Edmunds, Maine, 1862, 533 lives in 25 years. Barnsley was mine disaster capital of England, and too few people were ashamed of that. Mr. Morton, Queen's inspector himself, said owners armed themselves with clever lawyers and tampered with witnesses, and they kept getting away with it and avoiding blame. <laughs> The traditional lamp of 1866 will be carried by all personnel at the colliery. That will be workmen, trammers, and also viewers, officials, and under officials. Workmen would work with this type peak, a traditional peak. It is very thin and narrow, and the reason of that is because it was used to undercut coal, and it was easier for the collier to swing when he was laid on his side. The colliers would wear flat caps. This is a traditional leather miner's jockey hat. It's called a jockey hat because it looks like a jockey's hat, but they used to wear them that way. So an official would have an oil lamp in his hand and a stick. He would not carry a pick because he didn't, he would call. We were born in 1838, same year that 26 bairns drowned when Usker pit up Silkston flooded. Should have been playing in sunshine, not being underground, children at dark. It were like a curse to punish us, but we knew we were to blame. Lord Ashton tried to change things, but Toners bullied Parliament and pulled reports teeth. 1842 Act would have saved only 10 kids that terrible day and there were only one inspector to enforce it at time, so it were worth Toner's while to ignore it. There were all us families desperate for money, and every day, busier, busier, the risk increased, and the women and children left weeping and starving. The main gas that causes explosion is, is methane and um, the methane is entrapped in the carbon. And because it can't escape anywhere, pockets of methane will be contained even in the mi minute fissures of the coal. Inside there's gas. So a problem, one of the problems that you'd, you get from mining coal is gas, methane gas. Mm. So they've got to ventilate. When you're digging this out of the ground, it's got in little fissures, all gas escapes all the time. And if you're in a confined place like a coal mine, it'd be like being in a barrel of a gun. Fire damp is methane, but they know it's fire damp because if you lit it in the correct mixture with oxygen, it would explode. When the gas explodes, it produces other gases. And the first one that probably encounter would be the after damp, which is a mixture of gases, but the main one is the carbon monoxide, which will kill you pretty rapidly. Once the fire's exploded and it started to burn all the oxygen out, you're left with carbon dioxide, and if you're in excessive measures of that, you will choke, you will you'll asphyxiate uh, and die. This is a coal face similar to the one that had been mined in the Oaks. It was called the Borden Pillar method of mining, where they left a pillar of coal to hold the roof up. Later development so I'm using a system called the Long Wall method of mining. Still similar to the Borden Pillar, but wooden props held the roof up. The problem with Long Wall mining is there were more gas, but the benefits were they got more coal. They put in a new furnace in 1858 to improve ventilation. But former viewer John Brown said no amount of ventilation would prevent an explosion with the amount of gas that had leaked in past at Oaks.
during the disaster in 1866, there were over 40 ponies uh, died. 40 ponies died due to the disaster, to the explosion. Uh, now I I worked for, with ponies from 1957, and we had at least 40 at Manor at the time. And uh, they're amazing animals, the ponies, to work with. Absolutely fantastic. Better than working with men, believe it or not. <laughs> William Henry Hart, a young lad, was working with the donkey and the call it Tom. He was sat in a niche in the pit bottom area with his legs underneath the donkey and the donkey took the full force of the blast, enabling William Henry Hart to survive. I were at home, but youngest of me eight bairns, when Oaks exploded. It blasted coal from deep in belly of earth up to the sky, turning clouds ghastly grey and dropping its terrible death-laden soot on farms in Cuddeth, as they stood terrified in their frozen fields, as far as five miles away, they said. Black snow, strange, silky soft, bloody. A touch of hell to make thee tremble, a black-hearted, a deathly day. I've got my history going back 180 years plus in this area, so I was, it's a sculpture I thought I was born to make. The poignant thing is that when I was going through the records, I found out uh, that Ibison was on the list of fatalities of the Oaks 150 years ago. And uh, I worked it back. My uh, great, great, great granddad, Joe Ibison, had a brother called George, who actually died in this colliery, uh, this, uh, this horrible disaster. So. I've got an affinity with it. I didn't even know that before it started. We've gone out's print of a woman walking with a child, just the back view of her, with the child on this, on the her right hip, walking towards the colliery. It's exactly the same woman that I modelled. So that's a bit of a coincidence. I, you know, like. I mean, the airs on the back of my neck start tingling when I realised that, that coincidence uh, and that I was born to make this happen. That's me, stricken. My mum, my mum, what's to do? All I could think was run, lass. Grab squawking burn, a lint at pick top. Throw this and at Lord's mercy, though he's shown little on it in my life. This valley and this scene has took hundreds of lives and more today. But please, not mine. <coughs> I come to this shattered hole, shivering with cold and fear, a babe at my breast, smoke and flames <laughs> searing the sky. And my Tom, is he in heaven or hell? Or has he somehow surfaced? If alive, is he hell? Or is he a broken, twisted, half-melted man that'll never walk on his own again? Oh, God. Oh, God. If there's a smile in that black face, smile it now. When Pip went up, it was like a volcano. It shook all houses for miles around. All houses emptied and we ran. Wives, mothers, babes in arms, toddlers dragged, heedless of obstructions to pit top. With smoke, flames and charred wood rising, cages blown away. Some poor wretch were brought up burn black, his hair singed off his head, body blistered, hands and arms skinned. His cries when cold air reached his skin, when his wrapper fell off were excruciating beyond conception. And I saw my friend Kitty, when she heard his voice, her horror, her agony, screaming, oh, my poor lad, my poor dear Tommy, oh, dear. All the same, engineers and managers were brave enough when disaster we feared happened and took a full part in rescue activities. Mr Diamond were one at first down, but then he wouldn't speak to inquest. Mr Tewart, Mr Siddons and Mr Sugden were all killed in second explosion. Mr Jeffcock, who worked furiously all night substituting for Mr Woodhouse, were identified only by collar on his shirt. He was so mutilated. Mr Smith, who left Oaks for Lundell, and returned to help, were recognisable only by his fob watch.
by my workings, the shafts are either side of the little tree in the centre of the car park. And the shafts were very close together, which you can see on, on all the plans and maps. If we'd been stood here 150 years ago on the 12th of December, uh, you'd have felt the explosion. It was heard over a mile away and talked about potential damage being caused to Christchurch in Ardsley, yeah. above ground. So, you know, the, the extent of the explosion was huge. And the second one, actually, the one that killed the volunteer rescuers was even bigger. And that was the one that fired all three shafts and smoke billowed and could be seen for miles and miles coming from here. The pit was on fire at that point. Um, so every new pocket of gas was, was going up. Uh, the second one was the biggest of, of all the explosions. It was described in a Victorian paper as a, a vast Golgotha. Pit were on fire. Nobody could have survived. So we got ready to cap it. Then a miracle happened. F4 in morning on Friday, signal bell on number two shaft rang. We couldn't believe it. We lowered a bottle of brandy and tea down on the rope and it come up empty. We rigged up a makeshift winding gear and a kibble. Master Mammoth and young Tom Embleton went down. It were a perilous descent, because with no pumps working, water just cascaded on them. At the bottom they found Samuel Brown, terrified, Soaked and freezing. He crawled in dark or corpses of his friends to get there. To keep his spirits up, he sang Abide With Me. When the Elks exploded, there was just nothing to compare it. It was absolutely huge. Twice the size of Lund Hill, for example. There'd just been nothing else like it in in British mining, well, in world mining history. It was so extraordinary. And the impact was enormous on the communities. Virtually the entire adult male population of several streets in Hoyle Mill, a good part of Hoyle Mill, were eliminated in an afternoon. Indeed, I spoke in outbursts against my fellow cleric, Reverend Day, who expressed sympathy with the proprietors of the Oaks for their crushing sorrow at the terrible loss of lives and the bereavement of their relatives, admiring the able Mr. Diamond, whose agonies of spirit, he said, were greater than his loss of property. As a man of God, I have strong sympathy with the masters as men, but the most painful regret they should have must surely be that these same masters, as mine managers and engineers, fail to sink adequate shafts for ventilation to lessen the danger. If two other shafts had been sunk, this calamity might never have happened, and they were not sunk for reasons of expense. But what price is there laid on 360 souls, many without a grave, and their hellish deaths? The noble Earl Fitzwilliam brushed aside my controversy, and not one single soul in that chilling room supported me. Well, I would commend uh, people that have done, done research recently and uh, acknowledge what they've done, uh, but I've yet to see the historical evidence to absolutely back this research up. And I've gone back to my original work and uh, I've looked at resources again in the NUM archives. My conclusion tends to be once again in support of the 361 figure. Until I, I see any absolutely definite evidence of these extra 20 or 22, um, I think we've got to go back to the, the original three, 361 uh, figure. Uh, that, that's in the uh, in the official official report. Otherwise, what you're doing is rewriting history. This is about my community, the community that I was born in. I'm part of this community as well. This sculpture was made just down the road. She's a Barnsley lass. I wanted to focus rather on the coal industry. I wanted to focus specifically on the community. To me, she represents the community moving forward over 150 years. And in a way, um, the biggest monument or memorial to the Oaks disaster is the community that's around in 2016. It's been funded by the majority of the community it's in. It's been made 
within that community and it's going to be placed in that community. It's the end game of my sculpture career. It, it won't get any better than this. I said what? Sorry. Um, I'm a son of Barnsley, my great grandson as well. Um, so it's about me as well as the community moving forward. I'm emotionally involved in it and think I've laid all my emotions bare within it. And I certainly think it's the best sculpture I've made to date. And if I can finish on that, that's all I, you know, I want to do. This is where your history comes from. This is what you, you know, this is what mining was about. It wasn't just about making profits, it wasn't just about having a laugh. It wasn't just about getting coal out of the ground. This is what your heritage is about. We sometimes come across some bones. We did the other day, and we sent them up to the top. But nobody claimed them, and they were buried. There was only a skull and a piece of leg bone. I told you I'd get emotional. 